that he sensed the Holy Ghost was convicting their hearts when he preached to them. And that is very possible because um, a lot of times it's evident that people don't feel conviction from the Holy Ghost when they hear the gospel preached. But if someone does, you can, you know, you see, the, you see them respond. He might be referring to other evidence of the presence of the Holy Ghost in their lives. That he might be talking about the fruit of the Spirit or even the gifts of the Spirit that were seen. Uh, when, they, when they were converted, they also received the benefits of the Holy Spirit. They not only received the Word, but also the person of the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, which resulted in much assurance, because the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are the sons of God, it says in Romans 8. And Paul basically didn't have to assure these people they were saved. Once they received the gospel, they had that assurance. The Holy Spirit bore witness. It says in 1 John 5:10, He that believes on the Son of God has the witness in himself. And so it was not necessary for Paul to, to rally a whole bunch of proof texts that they were really saved now. They, they knew because there was power in their life to change. There was a Holy Ghost who came to reside in them. The assurance was there by the witness in their heart. Uh, Paul says, from these things I can know that you really are of the elect. Now he says, at the end of verse 5, you know what manner of men we were for your sakes, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Now here, when he says you became followers of us, he essentially says, you have had, you've, you're imitating us. You're having the same experiences we had. Later on in chapter four, 2 and verse 14, he says, for you, brethren, became followers of of the churches of God which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. Now, when we hear someone being a follower of someone, we might think that they became a disciple of Paul or a disciple of the churches in Judea. But here what he means is, you're following in the same experience they've had. And, you know, they were persecuted by their countrymen, he says in chapter 2 and verse 14. And so you're being persecuted by your countrymen the same as they were. So you've become followers of the churches of God in Judea. That is, you're experiencing what they've experienced. In chapter 1, verse 6, Using the same word, he says, you became followers of us and of the Lord. That is to say, Jesus himself received persecution, and so are we, and you are now too. So you're following in our footsteps in a very real sense. It's, it's sort of a thing that we all have in common. But what he says is, they received the word of, in much affliction and with joy in the Holy Ghost. That is, in spite of the fact that there has been a cost, a price to pay, for their becoming Christians, they still are glad they did. They still have the Holy Ghost producing the fruit of joy in their lives, uh, even though there's affliction. And a lot of people suffer for their views, whether they're Christians or not. There's a lot of people who suffer for their views. But a person who's really got the Holy Ghost, when he's suffering for righteousness' sake, will be happy. Many people suffer their views and are not happy. And even some people suffer for having Christian views and are not happy. But one has to wonder, has, has there been a work of God in their life? Jesus said, blessed. The word means happy. Blessed are you when men shall persecute you for righteousness' sake. So Jesus indicated that his disciples will really get a blessing out of it. it to be persecuted for righteousness' sake will give them a certain happiness. It doesn't mean there will be no pain. But there will be a deep joy that they have in the Holy Ghost as they are afflicted for receiving the gospel. And that's what Paul says these people were, so they showed themselves to be true disciples. And then verse 7 says, So that you were examples, or examples, to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Now, Macedonia and Achaia were northern and southern Greece, the two parts of the Greek peninsula. And these believers happen to be up in Macedonia, but he says that their testimony has become an example. Actually, in the, word, in the Greek, the word is types. They have personally become types of Christian experience. For all... Christians throughout not only Macedonia, their own region, but regions beyond, in, in southern Greece, in Achaia. And he goes on to, to develop that a little bit to show how he knows that. But notice this progression. They followed the example of Paul and his companions, and they themselves became examples to others. In verse 5, he says, You know how we were, and you became followers of us, and now there's others who are followers of you or who, to whom you have become an example. So there's sort of a chain reaction. Uh, one person's good example can 
produce a domino effect so that others follow their good example and others follow the good example of their converts and others theirs and so that the influence of one person by, you know, again, this sort of spiritual chain reaction can, can be very far-reaching. Uh, you don't have any idea how your Christian life, how many people, maybe hundreds, thousands, someday might be reached through the influence of your Christian life. Imagine, for instance, the person who, who led Billy Graham to the Lord. Uh, that person may not have influenced as many people as Billy Graham, but, but just think, you know, uh, of, of the positive influence that came from their testimony. Because, and, and then Billy Graham has led many people to the Lord who become servants, ministers themselves. There's, at least I, I myself made a, a commitment to the Lord uh, at a Billy Graham crusade, although I think I knew the Lord before that. I know that uh, Billy Graham had a tremendous impact uh, on me in my early life. And how many hundreds or thousands of people that Billy Graham has converted have become ministers and such. I mean, if, now that's, of course, you might say, well, I'm not a Billy Graham and I probably won't lead a Billy Graham to the Lord. You don't know that you won't, but the idea here is that you influence more people than you'll ever meet because you influence those who are in your immediate circle and they have an, they have an immediate circle around them that it goes beyond your immediate circle and they influence the people in that and then those that they influence can influence others so that these people follow the example of Paul and his companions and became themselves examples to others. And in verse 8, he gives an example of the kind of influence they've had and how he knows they've had a tremendous influence. In verse 8, he says, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. It's almost as though the gospel, they've already sent out missionaries or else at least uh, the reports of, of their response to the gospel are newsworthy uh, that, and reports are being carried to all parts of the area not only Macedonia and Achaia which you mentioned earlier but also other places he said in every place where every place includes I don't know but it must mean even beyond Macedonia and Achaia since those two regions are mentioned separately and when he says we need not teach speak anything seems to be explained in the next verse for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven. Now, he's saying that when I come to a place, I, I almost want to talk about you guys to these people and tell them how you received us and how you responded to the gospel and how you turned from your idols because I don't even have to make any mention because they've already heard it. And they tell it to me. When I get there to tell them, they've already heard it and they repeat it back to me. They themselves show or mention of us what manner of entering in we had. So, uh, this was an exceptional response to the gospel. And it has, uh, it has been blazed abroad so that even when Paul goes to new areas, uh, he already finds that people are talking about the Thessalonians and how Paul's influence there had started a revival. Now, in the end of verse 9 where he says, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, this is, of course, the the two sides of true repentance. They turn from their idols and they turn to God to serve Him. Uh, there is a place where some people put away their bad habits, whether they're Christians or not, because they see the damaging effect that bad habits have on their lives. And they turn from their bad habits, but they never do anything constructive for the kingdom of God necessarily. Uh, there are many selfish reasons to turn from bad habits and many people who aren't even Christians give up some bad habits for that reason. That is not repentance. Just giving up your bad habits is not repentance. That's only half repentance. Repentance requires that you give up your bad habits, but if that's all you do, you haven't repented in the biblical sense because it, you replace those habits with service to God. You cease to serve the idols and you start to serve God and your life is made available to God. And the time that you once spent doing things that are wrong, you now yield to God to do the things that are promoting his kingdom and his service. So that a person who simply turns from idols or turns from any sin uh, has not necessarily repented just because they've done that. Uh, repentance is seen in the fact that in turning from those things, they've taken on a new vocation of service to Jesus Christ. And to have uh, as their ultimate goal to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, 
which delivered us from the wrath to come. In saying that Jesus delivered us from the wrath to come, he means, of course, the wrath of God. They were experiencing the wrath of man. And it was some comfort, or intended to be some comfort to them, for him to point out, there is a wrath to come. And that, these persecutors, they have to face a worse wrath than they are putting up on you. Their wrath is being vented against you, and you're suffering as a result of it. But think of the wrath of God that they're going to have to face. And that wrath you have been delivered from. You will not have to stand uh, that judgment, that punishment that they will face. So it's supposed to be some comfort to those who are enduring wrath from man to remember that there is another, a greater wrath of God that they will not have to endure and which their persecutors will. Paul brings this up again in chapter 5, by the way. Chapter 5 and verse 9, he says, For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. So, we have been delivered from worse punishment, so we should be able to endure these light afflictions from the wrath of individuals who hate the gospel. Now, going on in chapter 2, he begins to remind them of what his ministry had been like, just in case anyone happens to be accusing him of having had bad motives, of having, uh, you know, come and uh, cause a lot of trouble and then left when, the, when it got too hot to stay around. So, he begins to remind them of what it was like. He does this in this chapter. Here's how I would break down this chapter. He first of all talks about the obvious purity of his motives in uh, verses 1 through 6. He talks about their motives and the purity of their motives. In verses 7 through 11, he talks about his gentleness of, of his manner and his methods. He, didn't, he wasn't oppressive. He wasn't authoritarian. He was gentle, like a nurse cherishing her children, he says in verse 7, or in verse 11, as a father does his children. So here, it's as an adult takes care of children. He dealt with them in a delicate and tender and gentle way. He first discusses his motives, then he discusses his manner. Uh, and then... In verses 12 and 13, I would say he mentions the, the glory and the power of his message that he'd given them. Uh, so that in combining a uh, recollection of his motives and his manner and his message, uh, he has basically defended himself against any kind of charges. He has, his message has been of the loftiest kind. It has been a call not to follow him personally, it has been a call not into a, a corrupt way of life, but it's a call to God's kingdom and glory. It's a tremendous message. It's a glorious message. And his manner of presenting it was in gentleness and meekness. And his motives were clearly not for money and was not to please men, as he explains in the first six verses. After that, he talks about the character of his opponents in verses 14 through 16. Those who had driven him out of town. I mean, if there's people criticizing Paul... Consider the source. Look at our character, he says at first, and then he says, look at their character. Look at them. They're contrary to God. They're contrary to all men. They don't let the Gentiles hear the gospel. And uh, then in verse 17, he kind of starts the subject that's carried on in chapter 3 about his present circumstances and the causes for writing the letter. But So in chapter 2, he essentially talks about his motives, uh, his manner and methods, his message, and then he talks about the character of his opponents by contrast. And this obviously is to uh, combat any kind of accusations that may have come against him in his absence, as no doubt many had from the persecutors. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance into you that it was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, Acts 16 tells how they had been beaten in Philippi and put in jail, you know how we had been, and that's when the Philippine jailer was saved. Uh, we were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not by deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which tries the heart. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, for, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. 
nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. Now here he mentions several things that indicate his motives were pure. In early days uh, of the Christian church, there were many wandering philosophers and religionists who would go around and seek to live off people. Uh, they'd try to peddle their philosophical wares and, and hopefully get some people who'd support them to do it full time. There might have even been some tendency among some of the Thessalonians to do that, so he had to tell them to go work with their hands uh, and not live off of people. But Paul himself set a good example. He didn't, he didn't use a cloak of covetousness. He says, God is witness. In other words, God, if you don't remember it, God at least knows that this is true in verse 5. He didn't take money. He didn't seek glory. I mean, what motives would cause a man to come in and do what Paul did? He didn't get any money out of it. He didn't seek glory out of it. Um, he, didn't, uh, he didn't deceive anybody. He came without guile. He didn't please men, which is, of course, one of the things that a, a false teacher would want to do. He'd want to win a popular audience by saying things that tickle people's ears. He says, we didn't please men. Our whole ministry was characterized by uh, a conscience toward God. We walked in the fear of God because we know that God tries the hearts, verse 4, uh, and so we had to please God in the way we conduct ourselves rather than pleasing men. And he points out in verse 5, God is a witness as to whether we use flattery to win people over or sought their money or sought glory from men. He says we didn't. In verse 6, he makes it clear we could have been burdensome to you because we are apostles and we, we would have the right to be supported for what we did, but we didn't. And we know he didn't because in chapter 3 of Second Thessalonians, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, verse 6, he says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which you received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, again, imitate us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but we wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not the right, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. So he says, when he was there in Thessalonica, he and his companions didn't take money from the church. Not that they didn't have the right to be supported. They did have the right to be supported. A minister does have a right to be supported by the gospel and by the church. But because he wanted to set a good example for them, and as it turned out, it's a good thing he did because he then was immune to charges that he'd come in for money because he didn't take any money from them. And he travailed night and day laboring so that he wouldn't charge them anything for the gospel. That's what he said. So he points out that when he was with them, they couldn't accuse him of greed because he earned his own keep. He didn't take money. He didn't take glory. Uh, he didn't say things to please men. And what's more, he says right at the beginning of this passage, in verse 2, so even though we had just come from a, a situation where we'd been badly persecuted in Philippi, we, weren't, we didn't come intimidated. I mean, a lot of times, you might go out there and preach on the street one time until someone comes up and knifes you. Next time, you'd be a little more meek, <laughs> you know. Next time, you think twice before you open your mouth where someone might come up and beat you up, you know. After you've had one bad experience, it, it, it might serve to kind of make you intimidated about future boldness. But he says, even though we received that kind of treatment in Philippi, yet we came and preached the gospel with you. Uh, in, we were bold in our God not bold in their natural strength, but in God, to speak unto you the gospel of God. So, in other words, we knew we were taking a risk. We, we were not going to get anything out of this. It was for your sakes. We took the risk of being treated shamefully again, and we actually were. We were treated shamefully in Philippi, and we knew that would happen again, or at least it could happen again, and yet we didn't hold back. We still preached boldly the gospel for your sake. We didn't get anything out of it. And so, of course, these verses make it very clear. His motives had to be pure. There was No one could say he did it for this or that wrong motive because the whole way he conducted himself would belie that. Then in verses 7 through 11, moving from the discussion of his motives to the manner and methods by which he ministered, he says, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted to you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because you were dear to us. 
For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable to you. Same thing we just read in 2 Thessalonians 3. Uh, unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe, as you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Now in verse 7, he compares his manner with that of a, a nursing mother cherishing her children. Or else just a, a nurse who was given the charge of someone else's children, but it does say her children, which means if, if it was not the mother, it would be a nurse. The children were hers in the sense that they were her charges. She was given charge of them. At any rate, the picture is of a, of a, of a kindly uh, a nurse or a mother taking care of small children. Obviously, that would be... The, the picture of, of, of uh, delicate treatment and, uh, and genuine care. And also in verse 11, he compares himself to a father who comforted and exhorted and charged. Here a father treats his kids a little more rough than a nursing mother does. A nursing mother coddles them and fondles them and, and keeps them safe. But the father, you know, he gives the exhortations and he kind of straightens the son out, you know. But he says, we play, we play both roles. We provided the protection and the love and the nurture that a mother does to her children, but we also played the father role. We, when you needed correction, we, we weren't ashamed to do it. We weren't weak. We weren't sentimental. Uh, we told you what you needed to hear, just like a father takes, you know, corrects his children. Now, in the midst of that, he describes quite a bit about their ministry there. And uh, he said in verse 8 that they were willing not only to impart the gospel with their own souls because they were dear to them, what does it mean to impart our own souls? Um, one might say, well, there's a place where a minister actually imparts something of his own heart, something of his own character to a person, but I don't think that's what he's referring to. Um, when he says our own souls, I think he means his own life in the sense that they were willing to lay down their lives also, to give their lives for, their, for the people and not just give them the message, but that they were coming to deliver something and if they lost their lives in the process, that was something they were clearly willing to do. Now, that might be subject to other interpretations, but from my personal consideration of how the word souls is used in the New Testament, I, I think that that's uh, probably what he meant. He says, For you remember, brethren, our labor and our travail. Now, he reminds them of how that he wasn't chargeable and he preached for free. Again, this is important to him because it proves that no one could say he was in it for the money. And I wish... I really wish that more ministers today could write these verses. It would be really nice if there were more... It would be nice in a sense if every minister could write verses 9 and 10 and could say to those who are examining their lives, say, you know how holy our lives are. You know how just we have conducted ourselves and how, you know, we, how we didn't take your money. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of ministers could not write such words today because even if, even if their motives are good, I mean, I'm not saying every, every minister who gets paid has bad motives. It is, it is a valid thing for a minister to be paid, but, but how good for a minister to be able to say, I haven't taken a penny from you people, so you know my motives are, are pure in that sense. When a, when a person does get rich in a high-salaried pastoral position or something else, uh, he may not be in it for the money, but it's kind of hard to prove it to anyone else, you know? You know, all these information about the salaries of Jim Baker and Jimmy Swaggart and all these people that are coming out, and, uh, you know, the, the news magazine's been playing it up. And of course, the fact these guys have made a lot of money off their ministries. Some of the money that's been made is, is outlandish. Uh, nonetheless, suppose Billy Graham or or Jimmy Swagger does make a salary that's bigger than the average uh, person makes. The real question is, what does he do with his money? Is his heart in the money? Does he, does he get a large salary and give it all away to the poor? I mean, what does he do with it? That's, that's the issue. How much money comes into his, into his uh, paycheck, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't tell anywhere near as much as what he does with his money. And so you can't really say just because this guy gets a lot of money, he's in it for the money. He might not be. But the trouble is, because he does get a lot of money, he's open to criticism from people who, who feel like they can say, look at that, this guy's in it for the money, it's so obvious, you know. And uh, 
Paul guarded very carefully against those kind of accusations ever sticking on him. People might have blamed him for it or charged him with it, but they had no grounds, and he constantly was able to remind them, I didn't take any money from you. I worked. I lived, I, my, my life and my conduct was a, a picture of holiness and justice. All my dealings, I was fair with everyone. I didn't cheat anyone. I was just in all my dealings. I lived a holy life. Uh, you can't pin any moral scandals on me. I mean, what a tremendous thing for a minister to be able to say that. And not, it shouldn't be unusual. That should be what every minister should be able to say, in a sense. At least about being just and being holy. But uh, that's not as common as we would hope, as we would wish it was. Verses 12 and 13, he talks about the glory of the message that he brought them. He says that you would walk worthy. This is what he exhorted them and charged them to do. That you would walk worthy of God who has called you into his kingdom and glory for this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when you received the word of God which you heard of us you received it not as the word of men but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe now he says our message was essentially that you do the same thing we do that is walk a life that's worthy of the God who's called you and if you wonder what that kind of walk is like, just remember what it is that God's called you to. He's called you to his kingdom and to glory. Now, his kingdom, of course, is to be under his rule. And it was this very word that got Paul into trouble when he preached in Thessalonians because there was, he was accused of preaching there's another king, one Jesus. And in fact, he did preach that. He preached there was a kingdom. And these people were called into that kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, with Jesus as king. And that it was a glorious call because they were called to share in his glory, in the, in the reign of Christ, in the glory of Christ, and to be transformed into Christ's image. This is the call that he says you've heard. Now walk worthy of that call. Walk worthy of the God who has called you to do that. And then he goes on to say, for this cause we thank God without ceasing because you did receive the word of God that way. And he mentions that when you received our words, you took it to be the word of God and not just the word of man. That's good, because, of course, the gospel is a message from God. But it would have been very easy for them, like their persecutors, to just take Paul's message as, as another human message, a message of human origin. But these people, because the Holy Spirit worked in their hearts to have their eyes open, saw this message was not just another message of human origin, such as they probably heard dozens of them before from other people. But this was something from God. And they were able to discern this word from Paul was not just from a man. This is from God. And they recognized it for what it was. And because they did receive it as the word of God, he says that word of God effectually works also in you that believe. That is, the word of God is not just sounds of words. The word of God is something alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, as it says in Hebrews 4.12. And that living, powerful thing is working in you. When you receive the word of God by faith, you become one of those who believe. And the word works effectually in those who believe. It brings about results in your life. Unlike other messages or words that you might receive that are of human origin, human words can only bring forth human results. But God's words can bring forth God's results. And the word of God once it is received and believed for what it is can bring effectual working in your life to change you to bring about divine results we could go into this more but I'm kind of racing against the clock some of these verses coming up actually almost all of them through chapter 3 we've already read and discussed but I'm not going to pass over them now let's look at them quickly here for you brethren be, became followers of the churches of God which in Judea are in Christ Jesus for ye also have suffered like things from your own countrymen, even as they have from the Jews. So he's saying, what you're going through is just what the earlier Christians, the first Christians were Jews, the first churches were in Judea, and they received persecution from their countrymen. He says, you're just following the same way that Christians have always had to go. Uh, the early Christians in Judea suffered it from their countrymen. You're receiving the same thing from your countrymen. Now, when he mentions the Jews, he goes on to talk about them. And again, there's a bit of bitterness in his voice about the Jews, though he is a Jew. He's not making a racial statement so much as he's making a statement about the certain class of unbelieving Jews that are always resisting God. And, you know, his statements would hold true not only in the context of his own day, but if you read the Old Testament, 
the, the Old Testament history of the Jews would confirm this. Read the days of Moses, or the days of the judges, or the days of the kings, and you'll find that what Paul says of the Jews of his own day is, is fairly characteristic of the Jews in the history they wrote about themselves in the Old Testament. And it says, they killed the Lord Jesus, so Paul lays it at their door. Because even though the Romans crucified Christ, the Jews delivered him up to Pilate. And Pilate was willing to let Jesus go, but the Jews insisted on his crucifixion. They had an, a vested interest. Pilate didn't. The Romans didn't. The Romans were just carrying out uh, an execution, a ritual execution of, of a man condemned. But the Jews are the ones who brought the false charges. They're the ones who pushed and even almost blackmailed Pilate, saying, if you let him go, we're going to tell Caesar about this, and you'll be no friend of Caesar's, and sort of blackmailed Pilate. So really, Paul lays the blame for the death of Jesus at the door of the Jewish people. They killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, as Jesus pointed out, that their killing him was not going to be anything different than they'd always done. They'd always killed their prophets, and they were going to fill up the measure of their iniquities by killing him. And they persecuted us. So they started out in history persecuting their prophets. Then the Messiah comes, they kill him. Now the messengers of the Messiah are being persecuted by the same group. You know, not the same individuals, because it's different generations each time, but he's pointing out that the Jews have, this is just their, their, their history. This is the way Jews do. That is, those who are unbelievers. There have always been a, a remnant of Israel, like Paul himself, who were believing Jews, and this doesn't describe them, but this describes those Jews that resist the truth, which was apparently all, that, all except the believing remnant. And he says, they persecuted us and they please not God. Now, see, that's the irony. The reason they persecute Paul, the reason they do what they do is because they claim to be doing this out of loyalty to God. But he says, they're not pleasing God and they're contrary to all men. So who are they pleasing? Just themselves. They're contrary to all men and God. That leaves no one to be pleased by them except themselves. And he says, they forbid us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Now, why should the Jews care whether the Gentiles are saved or not? It's just hostility against God, he says, against Christ. Here, the Gentiles, if the Jews don't want it, they should at least let the Gentiles take it. They're like the dog in the manger that won't let the cows eat the hay, even though the dog doesn't want it. He won't let the cows have it either. And uh, so they forbid us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, and they fill up their sins always. Now, Jesus said that in crucifying him, the Jews, in a sense, were going to fill up the iniquity of their fathers. But Paul says they're still filling up more and more by continuing to persecute the church. And it says, For the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. This statement suggests that the Jews who do not believe the gospel are laboring under the burden of God's wrath. And if we would cross-reference this with Romans chapter 1, where it says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Uh, Paul in Romans 1 uh, is usually considered to be talking about the Gentiles, and there's some evidence in the passage that it could be. But I feel there's good evidence that what he says in Romans 1 applies to the Jews who reject Christ also. They suppress the truth. They're the ones who don't let it be preached to the Gentiles. In their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth, and Paul says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against them for that reason. Well, how does Romans 1 say the wrath of God is revealed? God gave them up. God gave them over. God gave them over. Three times he says it. He gave them up to their own passions. He gave them over to a reprobate mind. That is the manifest wrath of God upon the people. And when Paul says the wrath of God has come upon the Jews to the uttermost, he seems to be saying that God has basically given them over to do their own thing. He used to deal with them as his chosen people, but no longer. They're now, he's letting them take their own course and he's not interfering at the moment. Uh, he will, of course. He might even be thinking in terms of the destruction of Jerusalem, which would 20 years hence take place. But by the way, this letter was written in 50, 50 A.D., in case you wondered. And so he might even be thinking that you know the wrath is going to be manifest ultimately in the destruction of their system in 70 A.D. But he definitely doesn't speak very highly of his own countrymen here. And this passage, by the way, does not lend much support to those who say the Jews, even in their unbelief, are still God's chosen people. And, uh, of course, I brought up that my differences with that position before in other classes, but to, to me this passage is one of the strongest arguments against that position, to say, as some say, that the Jews are still God's chosen people, even if they're in unbelief, just because of the promises made to their fathers. 
That doesn't seem to jive with what Paul says. Paul says the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. It doesn't sound like they're any chosen people of God if they're rejecting and persecuting the gospel and persecuting Jesus Christ. In another place, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, and he wasn't talking about the Jews particularly, but it was certainly the same thing would fall upon them. In uh, 1 Corinthians 16.22, Paul says, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, or cursed, or damned, anathema. So if anyone doesn't love Jesus, he says, let him be anathema. Now, this wouldn't mean people who have not heard the gospel and therefore don't love Jesus. He means, of course, those who know of Jesus and have not chosen to serve or love him. He says they're anathematized. And that would certainly apply in his own mind to these Jews who were, certainly didn't love Jesus. They, were pers- they killed Jesus and they were persecuting his servants. They're anathema. They're not blessed. They're not chosen people. Now, uh, the rest of this chapter and all of chapter 3, which is a short one, basically gives, again, uh, some of his present circumstances and the reasons that he sent t- Timothy and, and the reason the letter came to be written. And I'm going to read it without too much comment, uh, simply because I think it would be better to cover that material today than trying to add it to chapter 4 tomorrow. So it says, Wherefore, verse 18, no, 17, excuse me, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, but not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see you, your face, with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come to you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us, probably meaning because his friend Jason was bound over, he was between a rock and a hard space. If he came back into town, Jason would get into trouble because Jason had gone uh, surety for him. So he, he saw the devil's hand in this. This was a, uh, a scheme of the devil to get the Jews to work this out so that he couldn't come back to town. He wanted many times to come back. He, he says, I'm not really, I haven't abandoned you. In heart, I'm with you. Oh, it's just that for the time being, for a short time, I'm absent in presence because the devil has arranged things so that I can't come back. I've been hindered, even though many times I want to come. For what is our hope or our joy or our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. And what he means by this is, don't think that we've forgotten you. Don't think that we've abandoned you. In heart, we're still with you. We're forced by circumstances to be separated. But in our hearts, we, you, you are our joy and you are our crown when Jesus comes back and all of our labors are rewarded, you are going to be among those things that, that we rejoice in. The fact that you are fruit of our labors, um, we, you are of great value to us. You're like a crown of rejoicing to us. And he says, when the Lord comes, uh, you know, we, we, we put a lot of stock in the fact that you are our converts and that there's some rejoicing in, to be done over that at the coming of the Lord and some crown do us because of it. Chapter 3 continues, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. We are appointed to afflictions. He says, you know that, because apparently he taught them that. In Acts 14.22, we're told that Paul and Barnabas went to several churches confirming them and telling them that through much tribulation we enter the kingdom of God. That's Acts 14.22. It's interesting that in verse 12 of chapter 2 here, 1 Thessalonians 2.12, he said that God has called you to his kingdom and glory. But here he says he's appointed you to afflictions. It almost sounds contradictory. Are we called to kingdom and glory? Or are we called to affliction? And, of course, both statements are true. It is through afflictions and trials that we enter the kingdom of God. Through much tribulation we enter the kingdom of God and the glory is wrought in us through the sufferings. Our light afflictions work for us an eternal and exceeding weight of glory, we're told elsewhere. So, uh, there, the afflictions are part of the Christian life. It's not a strange thing. Verse 4, For verily when we were with you, we told you before that you should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass and you know for this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter, the same Satan, in verse 18 of the previous chapter, who kept Paul from coming back, this one might have done some damage to the church too, lest by any means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. But now when Timotheus came from you to us, 
and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith, for now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. And it was, we were dying to find out uh, if you were surviving. And when we heard that you're doing well, standing fast in the Lord, it was like a, a new lease on life. It's like we got our second wind. Now we were alive again. We were sort of at the. We were dying to hear, and now we. Now it's like we're revitalized. For what thanks can we render to God again for you for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? Uh, what he means is we've received so much joy uh, over you that we can hardly thank God enough for it. What can we do to thank God enough for this? Night and day we pray exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. So he's making it clear, I do want to see you. We're praying night and day that we'll be able to come again and see you. It's not as though we want to be where we are and be separated like this. For God himself is our, and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Um, Of course, we'll talk more about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints when we get to chapter 4 and verse 13 and following. Uh, Here his prayer is, first, that he might be able to come back to perfect their faith, to mature them a bit, um, and, but also in the meantime, he's praying that God would cause their love to increase, though we find that they already are notable for their labor of love in chapter 1 and verse 3. Yet they need to increase more, uh, more and more, and that they might be established unblameable in holiness. Love and holiness are the two things he's most concerned about for them. He's not praying for their health and prosperity, as some people think is the most important thing, but that their love toward one another and toward all men would abound and also that their hearts might be holy uh, in the meantime until he can finally come and, and continue to disciple them further. Then in chapters 4 and 5 he gets more into the, the real uh, meat of what he wanted to share and we'll save that for next time.